Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go over a bunch of information about the thesis. Uh, every once in a while, I usually touch back on the thesis, give my opinions around it, what it's all about, step through where we're at, uh, and go over a bunch of information to see how this thing is progressing. It is ultra important to understand where you are in the real estate, aka business cycle. Um, that's going to determine the market conditions of what does well and what does poorly. And that's why we should always be looking to see where we, where we are at in that business cycle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the demographic. I'm going to go over where I think we are in the business cycle or where a potential spot could be and the reasons why I think it. Um, there's a lot of people, Twitter, comment section, wherever, um, they just automatically think that they are, that we're, that this is done, that we are going into recession, it's all done, and the housing market's going to crash, all, all of these things. Um, I'm not as quick to make that judgment because making that judgment is very important. It is very important to understand where you are in this business cycle. If we're at a certain position and someone else thinks we're in a different position, we should be, at least as an investor, I'm going to be positioned for whatever direction I, or whatever position we are in the business cycle, I'm going to be positioned for that. Um, and if you're not even aware of the business cycle, if you're not even aware of where we are at in the business cycle, and if you're not even aware that the business cycle has an impact on investing or the investments, then yeah, I, I think you're pretty much out of touch with what's going on uh, and, and what assets outperform uh, certain assets during certain time frames. So let's get through here. It's going to be a lot to go over, depending on how long I want to make it and how much information I want to go over. Uh, we can go over some information, some data, and I can give you my opinions around it. So let's dive in here. Uh, I put it in, a, in this so it aggregates the, the stuff together, the, some of the information. So this is the demographic on an annual percent change in the U.S. population. And what we look for is we look for large percent changes in movements of population. That is what get, gets us our, um, we'll call it a, a rush into home buying years because the demographic overwhelms the inventories which then needs a bunch of new homes to be built. So what we want to do is we can add 30 years to the to this uh, population spike because that's when the average home buyer is. It's 30 years here, 30 years here, and over here it's 35, 36 years um, of age because that's, where, that's what the average home buying age is. And this could even be pulled forward a little bit because they were a little bit younger. So this is probably 20s. 30 and then 30s uh, as time goes on people are buying homes later and later uh, so what we want to do is we want to add the average home buying age to their birth date when they were born uh, and that is where you're gonna get that demographic shift so if i were to do that this here from the 20s all the way up here if you add into that uh, you add 30 years that's like the 1940s and 50s that's where this spike is. So that's like the mid 40s. This spike here would be the 70s because it's 60, late 60s to uh, 1980 or so, 82. And then here we had a spike, a little spike. That's the 2000 bulls market. That'd be 2000 ish uh, to late 2000s. And then we've got another one from 1990 uh, all the way till look like mid 90s. That spike. Uh, will be, if you add 35 years, that'll be around 2030 at the end uh, of that peak over here. So early 2030s. So that is what's driving this. That is um, what is driving the spikes. So if we were to take those dates that I just described here, if we took, um, and there was another spike back here too, which aligns with the 1920s um, purchasing. So it'd be 20s, it'd be 40s, it'd be 70s, and it would be uh, 2020s. 
is is the the spikes in the demographics. And remember, the percent change will go down as the population increases. So this population change is actually bigger than this population change. The millennials are bigger than this, but since we are adding, it, it's a percentage over a lot larger number, it's harder to um, have a percent change be larger. Uh, but the actual numbers wise, it is larger. This is the 18 year property cycle, AKA the business cycle. Um, these are rough estimates, they're not perfect. Uh, and when this is elongated, I think this will be elongated. So we've got seven years, a mid-cycle wobble is what they call it. Seven years, a peak, which is the winner's curse for two years. Then you go down for about four years, four to five years in a recession recovery. It's a recession phase. Your recovery phase starts here and it is that. That's the recovery phase. This is the expansion phase. And then this is the recession. That is the business cycle. That is where certain investments work well and other investments do not work well. When you look at this, this over here is called the hyper supply phase. That's where the supply kicks way up. Um, that supply overwhelms the market and you get a market crash. It's an imbalance in the market. And when we get that hyper supply phase and it crashes, that is where bonds do incredibly well. In the recovery phase, this is where stocks do well because it's low inflation and low interest rates, and it works off the inventory that we've built up during this phase over here. So this inventory gets worked down. We get this mid-cycle wobble. Generally, the way that I see it is interest rates start to go up towards the end of this in here. and we get a flush out of crap in the system. The system has to flush out bad loans, uh, bad businesses that can't survive in a higher interest rate environment. And then on this side, this is where we build a whole bunch of homes uh, because we're underbuilt in this scenario over here, we're way underbuilt. And we go into a hyper supply phase um, eventually where they build too many homes for the demographic. When that happens, we flood the market with homes, uh, interest rates, uh, we get a crash, interest rates drop, and the home market doesn't really, it doesn't really bounce back too much. Uh, the interest rates do not reignite the housing market in a, in a boom type of scenario because we, we ran out of the demographic that is pushing it. It's not as big. So, um, what happens is the expansionary phase are these big increases in population growth. Those are also uh, signified by high inflationary environments. So those high inflationary environments is what changes asset prices. I know, crazy, right? So when these, these large demographics come into home buying years, it creates inflation through credit expansion in the real estate market which creates the business cycle, and that creates um, market conditions where assets change differently. So these three periods that I'm showing you here are signified by these high inflationary rates. Now, 1931, that was also a demographic boom in the 19, uh, 19, early 1900s, 1910s, which isn't on that chart. But these, if you notice, there's three standout things three numbers here that stand out, 31, 69, and 22. And what that means is that we lost money on stocks and we lost money on bonds. How is that possible? Well, I can tell you how it's possible. It's possible by an increasing interest rate environment, especially an environment that increases it rapidly. And money shifts differently under an inflationary environment with an increasing interest rate. So, that is why this sticks out, and it sticks out because these are the beginning of each of these commodity bull markets. It's all in alignment, guys. Everything aligns with all of these cycles. This aligns with the business cycle. This is a indication of where we're at. So 31, 69, and 22. And if we were to look at a 
commodity ratio chart. And even if I had a longer term commodity ratio chart, which I wish I could have grabbed, um, in fact, let me grab it really quick to show you guys um, that cycle there. So one second, I'm going to yank it up real quick because I've got it. I know exactly where it's at. And it's right here. This is 100 years of commodity valuation. And if you remember those, those numbers there, uh, it's 1931. There's 31 guys right at a very low commodities radically undervalued. 1969, commodities radically undervalued. And then right now, uh, we are radically undervalued for commodities. So what that is signaling to us is that the market condition that preceded these big commodity bull markets, 22, 69, and 31, also are aligning with commodities that are radically undervalued. And what is that what is that telling us? It's telling us that the market conditions are aligning for a commodity bull market. That is what it's telling us. And when I'm talking about this stuff, it is long term. It's it's a decade bull market. It's not uh, something that lasts uh, for a year. I mean, this one lasted pretty short all the way to 33, 34. But this was a, over a decade. This is going to be over a decade in the 2000s with that demographic. That was about a decade as well. So we have a what I think uh, a ripe market conditions, given where we are in the business cycle, given the demographics that are driving it, given where we are with the commodity valuations. And here's the commodity valuations uh, for here. We're way down here. And I think this is going to come on up based off of all of those conditions. And we could have a very large commodity bull market. And we're in that bull market. It's already started. The money's rotating. That's why we're seeing these ratios start to turn up. That's why we're seeing the numbers here come into this left-hand corner because of inflation and interest rates and all of those things. Now, in technical analysis, what we want to see and what we should see is we should see a decline in commodities. So what this means is under these certain market conditions here, a decline in commodities is going to happen through here all the way up to the mid-cycle wobble. There'll be a decline in commodities here, and then the commodity sector outperforms during this um, expansionary phase of real estate. So this is what kicks it off, is the market conditions changing, the interest rates going up and all that stuff. We have a low ratio that is also in alignment. And then we, what we want to look for is we want to look for commodities that are at the ideal buy points for a lot of these commodities. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a downward movement, a basing pattern, and then you're going to see a breakout of a trend line or a, a breakout of the top of the basing pattern to the upside, signaling a new bull market. This is a double bottom. I call that the booty bottom. You get a lead in pattern, then you get the bottom. Uh, we can also see continuation patterns as well. If you've got strong stocks where maybe they came down and then they, they based out for a while and then they've broken out. We should be seeing these types of patterns in the markets. This is a continuation pattern. This is a bottoming pattern. And there's obviously more bottoming patterns than just this. But I'm seeing these types of patterns in the commodity space all over the place. So let's go into, um, into the charts. And I want to show you the data, the information that we're seeing in the chart sets uh, setups. So when we back out and we look at gold, right? Um, what we should be seeing is a pattern, which we see this is a cup and a handle pattern, and we're at the top side of it, broken to the up, upside of this. Well, what does this mean? It means that the business cycle and where we're at in the business cycle is most likely turning inflationary, and that inflation is going to drive gold higher. That is what it's, it's telling us, that gold is sitting on top of a pattern, broken out, and we're not, we're not getting any selling pressure up here. Notice that? It's all small down candlesticks. The sellers are gone. The buyers remain. And right now, we're consolidating on top of a pattern before we, we, we drive higher. 
That's what this is. This here is a consolidation on top of a pattern. This is a consolidation or a retest on top of a pattern. And that's what we have. We have a breakout of a big pattern and we're consolidating before another move. What makes this even stronger is that silver has also broken out of its long-term uh, wedge pattern. So if we look at this, these are big patterns. Guys. Um, this is all the way from the mid to uh, late or early 2010s, all the way to uh, a breakout here of just today. We're sitting on top of the pattern. We look at the, the way that this is trading and we don't have selling pressure here. It's a bunch of buying pressure. The green army showed up and it's just languishing sideways with no selling pressure. This is exactly what I look for in a potential buy setup. We're sitting on top of the pattern, the breakout. There's your breakout here, sitting on top, and there's no selling pressure, and we've got support right underneath us. That's what I look for. Gold's doing it, silver's doing it, uh, and we've got cup and handle patterns all over the place with this. Platinum is also doing it as well. Uh, plat there's platinum that has broken out. You can also draw this, this line a little bit differently. Uh, you can kind of come in here. Some people draw it like this, uh, where we've broken out and we're sitting on top of the pattern. Maybe we do a full retest down here. But there's not much selling pressure. We've got lots of buying pressure. That's exactly what I look for. Platinum, silver, gold all look very good. And they exhibit exactly what we should be seeing and are in alignment with where we are at in relationship to where these are positioned. They're all aligned and positioned in a certain way. So um, we can look at crude oil. Uh, if we look at crude oil, and I, I, I put an overlay of crude oil here. So I took this, um, what I did is I took this and I, I took it from, I took this uh, bars pattern here and I overlaid it and, and basically put it over the current pattern. What we have in crude oil, if I put it on logarithmic, I don't want to do it because it's going to blow up the pattern, though. Uh, if we put it on the logarithmic, it touches this guy here, and we did a full retest. Now, back in the last bull market, we had a little bit more of a pullback than what we've gotten today. Um, so this is the last bull market that I grabbed. And it moves exactly the same way as what we have today. And that, if that were to, if this were to move back the same exact uh, amount, given the size of this fractal, we would pull back to the 50s, upper 40s, low, um, upper 40s, lower 50s. But the projected price move of oil, if the bull market were to move in the same fractal, uh, we would project that oil could potentially go to $563. And the duration, since I overlaid this fractal roughly the same of how I think it aligns, would align with a peak in 2031. If that were the case, if this were to align the, this fractal being the same as this fractal, just being larger because of the fractal size in the beginning of it, uh, this aligns with exactly a 2031 date of where the demographic runs out here. Uh, that is 35, 36 years of age added to 1995. So if you add that up, you get 2030, 2031. And that demographic aligns perfectly with this movement. Now, I know I said that oil is going to go way higher, right? $250, $300, $400, $500, right? This is also aligning with that move uh, of $560 at 2030 if it moves in the same fractal wave kind of length as this guy in the previous cycle. Um, I don't know what it's going to do. I don't have that, that uh, crystal ball. But if I were to just do a calculation here just to see, and let's say we go to 500 uh, and we get to a ratio of gold times, so I'm going to multiply it by, let's say it's seven or so. Um, that means gold's at $3,500 at that time. And that seems entirely possible for that to happen. In fact, if gold goes higher than that, this could go even higher because of the inflation in the system. So that's what I see. And it looks like to me that oil is setting up a gigantic bull market. Now, I can look at a bunch of different charts. I can look at uh, REMX, rare earth metals. Uh, this is a natural you know, commodity. There's your double bottom. And then where's your ideal buy point? Well, it's basically where we're at right now. So it's a downward movement. 
we come into a double bottom, and then we're at an ideal buy point. COPX, copper, same thing. It's the same thing. We come down, we go into a double bottom, we've broken the uh, neckline or whatever you want to call it, and we're at the ideal buy point right where it's about to start in an upward trend on a big picture view. That doesn't mean this can't go down in the short term because of recessionary fears or whatever. Big picture view, though, that's starting a bull market for COPX and for REMX uh, and for a lot of these other um, areas. Uh, this is XHB from a longer term perspective. This is a bull market. We are heading higher in home builders. The home builder prices are increasing. More data. That does not look bearish to me. That is in an uptrend. And it started, so this here is the recession. This is the recovery phase in here. Um, from 09 all the way till 2020, that is a recovery phase. We get a mid-cycle wobble. We've been wobbling over here. Um, and I think we are going to launch. Um, as weird as that sounds, and I know that the affordability is bad. I know all of the, the information and data that the bears got. But you know what data they're overlooking? They're overlooking the, the actual demand and supply of the market. That is why the unaffordability is where it's at today. It's, it's a combination of supply and demand and the interest rate going up. But this here, if we continue to see housing starts increase, that is where this home builders will continue to go up. So we look at housing starts, we can go down there and check housing starts out and more data of where we are in this cycle. So if we were to go to, now I'll get down there, housing starts. So here is housing starts. And we back out, big picture view. Our commodity bull markets are from the orange circle to the other orange circle. These are those expansionary phases. In the 1970s, when that demographic came through, we had a demographic that, that came into home buying years, came out of home buying years, came back into home buying years. During this cycle here, where it came all the way back down, we had a boom and bust cycle. This here, we came in, in the early, I said in the mid 70s, we had a ton of inventory. It was over 10 months of inventory during that time frame that forced the housing market lower. We also had the demographic dip during that time frame. There's that big dip in the mid-1970s. That's the big mid-cycle mid dip, is that demographic dip. That demographic dip also coincides with 10 to 12 months of inventory. And it also coincides with the housing starts dipping. The recession was caused by the dip in the demographic and by the dip in housing starts, in my opinion. That was the slowdown. And here we are, uh, again, we came back up in the late 70s for that, the, the waves. The, the three waves that were created was created by the demographic. Wave one, wave two, wave three. That's the three waves that, that was created in inflation. And it was created from the housing market interacting with the, with the world, the inflation and all that stuff. Here's another housing market boom. And here's your mid-cycle wobble. Your mid-cycle wobble happened in uh, 98 down to the bottom of 2000, uh, 2000, and then we started taking off again. Um, and again, this is a, the interaction between the demographic uh, interest rates and the market and the undersupply. The undersupply, which are these bottoms here, drove the booms afterwards. One thing that we can notice on the housing starts is we've got the largest undersupply that we've ever seen. You can see these small little ones. Look at the area under the curve. That's this area under the curve here. It is very small in all of these scenarios. It's kind of big in the early 90s. This one is massive, guys. The area under the curve is huge. Um, and that is where we get these large um, estimates of potential undersupply. Uh, 3 million to 7 million homes undersupplied is the market, given how many millennials there are and the number of people uh, and, and 
family formations in the market. And I'm using other people's data on that. Um, it's not just one person's data. It's a bunch of people who have tried to nail that down. But we are in a mid-cycle wobble, I think, uh, where interest rates are being absorbed. Uh, what that does is it puts us roughly in this cycle here, I think. And it's very important to get this right, because if you get it wrong, um, you're not going to know which investments I think will continue to do well. And this is from the credit side. It's not from the supply side. This is definitely not from the supply side, but it's from the credit side. So this is what we've seen there. And I think that's where we're at is the mid-cycle wobble with the demographic leading this and the undersupply. So it's the demographic interacting with the housing market and the inventory levels. That is why we don't see any inventory of existing homes. And that lack of inventory of existing homes is going to drive new home sales. That is going to drive this cycle that we're looking at into an expansionary phase, which are all these big guys up here, it's going to drive us upwards, however high it's going to go. And interest rates can impact this through the affordability, and it can slow it down. But the demographic is there to cause this imbalance of supply and demand. That's what's driving it. Now, I also have some more information here. Um, if we were to look at gold production history to, to further gather more data, remember those uh, areas. I'm talking about the 1930s. So, he, so here comes in the 1940s. What did we see in go world gold production? A decline in world gold production in the 40s with a credit expansion of the business cycle. 1970s, it was the same thing. We saw a decline in world gold production during that time frame that we had credit expansion. We also have a decline from 2000 all the way till 2008 in world gold production. And that is also what aligned with the credit expansion in the system. So credit expansion, credit expansion, credit expansion with production going down. Barrett Gold is projecting that very same scenario to, to happen. So if we were to look at Barrett Gold here, this is their supply forecast. From 2020 onward, and 2020 was the, you know, 2022 is the year that is the bottom of the commodity market that is shown here. 2022, 69, and 31. We've got the same alignment as we have at every single other precious metals bull market. We have a decline in uh, supply or production. At least that's what Barrick is saying. And if you were to look at the numbers, this is 100, 110 million ounces all the way down to 62 million ounces. That's a 40% plus decline in production of gold. We have these same types of declines occurring in a bunch of different markets. Uh, we have a, a decline in copper, uh, nickel, silver, gold. Uh, oil is going to run some deficits because of the capital investment cycle. All of these things are going to be undersupplied at the same time that we are going to be driving credit expansion. And what puts the Federal Reserve in a very difficult position here is that they can't lower interest rates because it's going to blow up the housing market to the upside because there's no inventory. And that's going to allow the fuel for new home sales. And what new, new what the new home sales guys are doing is they're buying down interest rates to sell homes. They're getting smart. So that's what's that's what's occurring and that's what's happening. That's part of, that's where we are in the cycle in my opinion. Could someone argue it? Sure, you can argue it. And and that is the data that I've got. So if I were to sum it up really quick, we have a larger demographic coming into home buying years. That's the credit, that's the supply demand imbalance of the housing market. We are also undersupplied in the housing market given how few homes we, we built in the recovery phase of uh, real estate. So we're underbuilt and we have a larger demographic coming into home buying years. That's why existing inventories are nil. That's why they're so low. Interest rates went up, 
affordability went down, and it's slowing that market down. It's not stopping it. It's slowing it. We're starting to see it, the housing market in terms of new home sales. They're above the average. So we've broken above average. Yes, we've come off the, the highs uh, in 2021. But we're still above average, and I expect it to stay above average or go higher. Now, if it goes lower, maybe we got a slowdown coming. The previous market slowdowns came from the demographic slowing down and the housing market overbuilding. And then we cycled through it quick. I think that we're in the mid-cycle wobble portion. I think we have to build a lot of homes to catch the market back up. Uh, it is estimated that we have a market deficit of three to seven million homes, depending on whose data you use. So that deficit impacts the supply and demand. The supply and demand just doesn't go poof because of affordability is bad. It's still there. And they're saving money every day to go buy a house. So that, that's, that's where we are, in my opinion, in this cycle. You look at the commodity to stock ratio. Commodities are cheap. You go and you look at um, the start of each of these cycles and how the market conditions were behaving at the beginning. 2022 exhibited 1969, which exhibited 1931 of major bull markets in commodities. So those also occurred. So we have the right market conditions that were set up at the beginning of these bull markets. So that, that's happened. We look at the technical analysis of all of these different charts and start piecing them together. We're putting in double bottoms. We're putting in inverted head and shoulders. And all of these other patterns are breaking to the upside. And we're at our, quote, ideal buy points. Now, are we going to get a, recess, a recession here like the 2000s, 2001, and get a mid-cycle wobble in the real estate market? It could do that. And it looks like it's doing that in the housing starts. But when interest rates go back down because the market slows down or if there's problems in other portions of the economy, we could see a, a resurgence of housing starts that will kick off a gigantic boom in commodities, because that is where the shortages are. Money is going to go where the shortages are at to solve problems. And if the shortages are in commodities, that's where the money will flow. And under those conditions, it's going to create inflation, consumer price index inflation, because the shortages are there. We've got shortages looking out in gold, silver, platinum, oil. Um, we'll see what happens in natural gas. I know there's a little bit of a glut going on right now which is a buying opportunity uh, over the next year or so. And that can be worked off very quick. We've got shortages in copper, nickel, and all these other base metals. Uh, they're coming soon or already started. Inventories are low in all these different metals. That's why the prices are up. Even though we've got a slowdown in the markets, prices are remaining high. They're sitting on top of support in a lot of these patterns. We've thrown double bottoms on rare, rare earth metals. Inverted head and shoulders uh, are being created in oil. A lot of the oil companies and oil ETFs. Uh, we've got other uh, things breaking out as well. If you were to look at the producer price index against stocks, that is breaking down where producer price index is going to outperform stocks. We also see, and I'm not going to post all this, uh, that the ratios of the commodities are starting to break out against stocks themselves, against financial assets. Uh, crude oil is, gold is, all these different ones, and they're at very low levels. So we're very early in this bull market, which I also think means that we're early in the expansionary phase of real estate because of the imbalances. And this all aligns for what I think is going to be a commodity bull market. That's the data that I have. If you guys have conflicting data, I would love to hear how a commodity bull market is not going to happen. Put it in the comment section. Love to hear it. Um, and what I mean by this, I'm looking at it from a long-term perspective, 10 years plus, five, 10 years plus. Um, I'm not looking at it from three months from now, six months from now. I'm looking at the big picture view uh, and how all these things are interacting with each other. Uh, but that's the thesis. That's what I see in the markets, and uh, that's my data that I'm seeing and how I am interpreting that data. All right, guys, if you guys like this content, give me a thumb up, subscribe to the channel, 
Uh, if you guys want to take, partake in this big commodity bull market that's coming, I've got a bunch of ideas on finding-value.com. Uh, you can become a platinum member, join our community, and we can take advantage of this cycle in commodities with either conservative companies, highly leveraged companies. There's a bunch of things that um, we can look at, looking at different fractals and all sorts of stuff, uh, because we do have a first wave that's already come through, and we can see which ones could potentially outperform during wave three uh, when wave three uh, gets kicked off. All right, guys, uh, we'll catch you later. This is Finding Value.